go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we love and honor you. We thank you for your many uh, abundant blessings. Father, we thank you for your word, God, that corrects and mends us. Your word that um, cuts us open and heals the deepest, darkest secrets that we have. Father, we thank you, Lord, that you didn't leave us alone, that you left us with your spirit, uh, your comforting, your correcting, your convicting, your teaching, Holy Spirit. Father, we love you. Father, when we come before you in the mighty name of Jesus the Christ, Father, asking that that Holy Spirit will till up the ground of our lives so that this word can be settled deep within good soul and that the Spirit of God can come and that the seed will bring forth fruit. We love you and honor you in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Amen. You know, a fairly typical way that I uh, leave church on Sunday and Wednesday is I go listen to my favorite preacher, which if you know, uh, that would be Pastor Greg Locke. Now, I've said this multiple times. I was not uh, fond of the Greg Locke that was pushing politics from behind the pulpit. If you know me, you know my feelings about that. But the Greg Locke that was baptizing an eight-year-old girl a couple of years ago and a demon manifested, and he went on a two-week fast trying to figure out what in the world was going on. The Greg Locke that was a capital C cessationist that is believing and operating in the gifts. I like that guy. The Greg Locke that weeps when he repents over the way he used to be. The Greg Locke that deleted over two billion, two billion, two billion Facebook posts because he's a new man. The Greg Locke that shut down his YouTube channel, the old one that had hundreds of hundreds of million subscribers because there was a new one. I like that guy. And when I left here, I got through preaching. I got home and he was preaching. He was preaching similarly. And then he said something that really got my attention. How many people know that God has themes, right? So what I'm preaching here at this church, if the guy down the road, he might be preaching something similar because God has a point to make. Well, he said this that got my attention. He said the biggest issue we've got inside the church today is people operating, living under an orphan's curse. Now, if you wasn't aware of what I preached on Wednesday night, I, I ask you, I, I implore you, go back and listen to the message. God has been giving us some practical revelation of the importance of breaking this particular curse. So uh, if you need the sermon notes, uh, reach out to me. Uh, send me your email address on Facebook Messenger and I'll send it right to you. If you want these sermon notes afterwards, please do the same. Uh, Wednesday nights uh, uh, was interesting. We had a move of God. And let's just start off with a scripture. Romans 8 and 15 says, So you out, and I'll be reading out of the NLT or the New King James Version. And I'll be going fast. So if you want to try to keep up, you can. If you want the notes, just send me an e send me a message and I'll send you the notes. So you have not received a spirit that makes you fearful slaves. Instead, you have received God's spirit when he adopted you as his own children. Now we call him Abba Father. We clearly see the fact that we will inherit certain curses and certain blessings from our ancestors. There's no way around it. Wednesday we talked about the course of, an, of the orphan. When Adam and Eve allowed the enemy to exploit their pride. You know that's how all sin starts, right? You're enticed by your pride. When he, what, when, when they allowed him to exploit their pride in inciting them into rebellion, please turn the reverb down, man. I, I'm hearing myself three times. Their opinion of God changed. So when they rebelled, what happened to them, what the most detrimental thing to them was is that their opinion. Listen, we got to have the right opinion of God. If we got the wrong opinion of God, we're building a foundation that will not stand. See, Satan 
was envious of mankind's dominion. Angels, including Lucifer, were created with free will, but they had no dominion. There was a lot of, I believe that um, three heavenly realms, why not believe that? Because the Apostle Paul was taken to the third heaven. So if there's a third heaven, there's got to be a second and a first heaven. I believe that there's a first heaven that's right here. I believe that in the Garden of Eden, God's heavenly family and God's earthly family walked together. I don't think it was unusual for the devil, Lucifer, the morning star, to communicate with Adam and Eve on a regular basis. But see, there was something found in Lucifer. There was pride found in him. And when he seen that God had created man a little lower than the angels, and he noticed that, and he seen that God had given man dominion over this earth, Satan got jealous. And when he fell, when he tempted Eve. So a lot of times I condemn Adam because he let his wife talk to the snake. I think I'm wrong. I think up to that point, it was regularly spoke to the snake. If you want a little more information on that, read uh, Michael Heiser, some of his work on the spiritual realm. <clears throat> so the angels created without free will, created with free will, but don't, no dominion were created to do the bidding of the Lord God Almighty, the Lord of hosts, the Lord of heaven's armies. That's why they existed. But since they had free will, they wanted the dominion. And, and they took it for 4,000 years. If a believer doesn't allow the curse of the orphan to be broken over them and evict all the spirits of rejection and abandonment, they will continually suffer the constant torment of the enemy. So when man was separated from God, and when he sinned, there was a curse placed over man. It was a curse of separation from Abba Father and mankind. So if you don't deal with this thing, you can. We got folks that have been saved 40 years that are still acting like orphans. They'll never be able to accept the love of anyone. They just will always reject it. They'll never fully grasp it. They'll always have walls up. They'll never fully realize the depths of God's love for them. They'll be envious and even jealous of others' success. They will not be able to forgive fully. They'll not be able to accept correction. Their spiritual growth will be minimum or non-existence. Orphans live in fear. They live from fear and fear has twins. Guilt and shame. Guilt from the past, shame for today. Shame is based on the deception of the enemy. The devil has convinced you if you're operating under this curse that you're not who God says you are. Orphans are frozen in the past. Worry about the future. Their minds is filled with trouble of the future and trouble of the past. Trying to make plans, trying to figure things out. And then what happens when I live in my past? What happens when I'm worried about the future? God, did I allow the enemy to steal the peace of my present? See, I'll take it one day at a time. I, if I'm worried about what's going to happen tomorrow, what's going to happen to me? I'm not going to have peace today. If I'm worried about the sins that God has forgiven me for, what's going to happen? I'm not going to be operating in the full authority that God has given me today. The Lord has a plan for each of us, a position that we need to fill in the body of Christ. Revelation of His plan for us individually comes as we grow in our intimacy with Him. Our relationship with Abba Father is like all other relationships. They require us to work on the relationship. The enemy doesn't want you to know you are a son and a daughter of Abba Father. Because sons and daughters understand Abba's Father's love for them. They're not only excited about the success of others, they participate in the success of others. Sons and daughters aren't working to earn God's love. They are working out of the revelation of the love that God has for them. 
sons and daughters of Abba Father walk in freedom intimately knowing the love of Abba Father. Because of the guilt, because of their rebellion, Adam and Eve allowed shame to push them into hiding. Their opinion of God was now based on fear. Abba Father, knowing all things, existing outside of time, and being all-powerful, knew his children had rebelled. It was not a surprise to God when he showed up in the cool of the day. He knew what happened. He knew that their shame caused them to hide. But God showed up for his appointment. Adam would eventually reveal himself to the Lord, but instead of confessing their mistake, he would blame Eve, and then Eve would blame the devil. Psalms 32, 3 through 5 says, When I kept silent, my bones wasted away, though my groaning all day long. For day and night your hand was heavy upon me. My strength was dried up as by the heat of summer. I acknowledged my sin to you. I did not cover my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgression to the Lord, and you forgive the iniquity of my sin. Let me tell you why you don't confess your sins. Because you don't intend on stopping number one. Number two, the reason you don't confess your sin is because you don't understand the blood that flowed from Calvary's cross. You've not got a full grasp of John 1, 8 through 10. It says that if any man says he's without sin, he's a liar. But if we'll confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. But we walk around riddled down with the sin of our past because we're afraid somebody's going to judge us. Let me tell you, somebody's going to judge you. But it don't matter what people think. Get rid of that stuff. Confess it quickly. Get over it. Get on top of the church stop. Shout it to, from heaven to hell. Take the information. Take the, the equipment away from the enemy that he's using to destroy you with. Amen. As soon as you confess that sin, Satan no longer has anything to accuse you of. Y'all know that, right? Yeah. If Adam and Eve had shown up for their appointment time, things would have been different. Much different. Could you imagine they got deceived instead of them covering themselves and hiding from God? Can you imagine what would have happened if Adam and Eve would have ran to God and said, Lord God, I'm a father. I have sinned against you. Please forgive me. I'm not sure we would be out today, but I'm sure things would have been different because we serve a merciful and a gracious God. When you slip up, show up. Confess quickly and allow the Holy Spirit to cleanse you. A curse is when the enemy exploits generational inclinations toward particular sin. We see that they always start as generational iniquities, but when we fall into the enticement and the deception of the enemy simply believing his lie, the curse is realized. The enemy uses these familiar spirits, spirits that are familiar with the issues of our bloodline to entice us into continual sin, which then bursts the curse. So I'm born innocent. I'm not guilty of my father's sin. I'm not guilty of my grandfather's sin. But if I don't deal with their sin, if I don't deal with the inclination, if I don't address it, I will follow my father's footsteps into that sin, and then the iniquity becomes a curse. Well, we got the first curse which all other curses flow from, and it's the course of the orphan. All of them stem from pride. It was pride that led Satan to think that he could elevate himself to the status of the Lord God Almighty. When Satan rebelled, rebelled he became isolated from Abba Father's love. And Adam and Eve became orphans when they allowed pride to dictate their behavior. Don't allow pride to dictate your behavior. Pride says I'm never wrong. Pride blames it all on somebody else. Pride is always looking at other people's problems. Pride doesn't get real with yourself. The first curse was a curse of isolation from Abba Father. It is being separated. It is the orphan's curse. 
It is from the curse, separation of Abba Father, that all other curses come. When we are rejected by our earthly fathers, abused by our earthly fathers, abandoned by our earthly fathers, when our earthly fathers refuse to fulfill the role as priest, prophet, provider, and protector of their families, the orphan curse is exacted in our lives. And it is this curse which all other curses flow. You said, Ron, you said that five times. I'm probably going to say it five more because I got a, real, a little revelation. If I can deal with this orphan's curse, if I can convince you that God loves you, that He's not mad at you, that He wants to make things right, if I can tell you how deep His love is, if I can show you that His blood is sufficient to cover all of your sin, and I can tell you that God wants to restore everything you allowed the enemy to steal, then you can walk in freedom and not in bondage. The enemy's favorite is the orphan's curse. It is the most effective at keeping his children in bondage. We see in Exodus 20, 4 through 6, where it says that God, the first two commandments are important now. They're important. I have no other gods before me. Don't bow down to any idols. If you can't consistently come to church on Sunday morning because you've got a hobby, let me tell you, whatever your hobby is, is your God. Period. You have an idol. Whatever keeps you out of your Bible and keeps you from praying is your idol. Is your idol. Whatever keeps you separated from your calling, if you have a career that is more important than your calling, and listen, I'm all about men, men and up and providing for their family. They said that a man won't take care of his family. He's worse than an infidel. But you got a calling on your life. The calling first is to be the priest, the prophet, the protector, and the provider of your home. The mother has a calling too. But outside of that calling, God has something for you to do in the kingdom. But when you fail, those iniquities pass on. You want to keep your kids from having the trouble that you've had? Let me give you a simple word. Repent! It's not that complicated. Stop the enemy in his track. And I'm not saying your kids are not going to have trouble. I'm just saying that they're going to know their way home. Somebody say amen. amen. My dad came to the Lord when I was about six years old. He had made a deal with the Lord saying that he would fulfill his calling to preach if the Lord would make a way for him to win the vice presidency of the Iron and Steelworkers Union at Bowman Transportation. So he got down by bed. He knew he was supposed to preach. His father was a preacher. His father always told him he was going to preach. It was evident that my dad was going to preach the gospel. Bowman Transportation was a mess. He made a dollar an hour, worked 30 hours straight one time, went home to get some sleep, and they fired him. It was, the working conditions were awful in the late 60s and early 70s. Mama remembers all too well. I remember the picket lines. I vaguely remember the picket lines. They're a little different back then than they are today. You cross a picket line back then, you're going to get beat up. You're going to get shut up. Your tires are going to get punctured. They're going to shoot a bullet hole through the block of your truck when you try to cross that picket line. But they were very needed. So over 3,000 men voted. My dad prayed. He knew that he was the man to turn this organization around. So he got on his knees. He said, God, if you will let me win this election, I'll preach your gospel. So what did he do? He got to work. He changed things. He organized them. He went on strike. He got them a decent wage. He got them much improved working conditions and medical benefits. After a few years of daddy using his God-giving pastor's heart as VP of the union, the Lord decided it was time for daddy to honor his vow. This was the same time that my big brother was at Shady Grove Free Real Baptist Church at about 12 years old, pouring his heart out to God. He didn't even hardly know why he was praying. God just birthed a burden in his heart for his mama and daddy. Because things at home, I vaguely remember, things at home were a mess. Daddy finally repented only after 
our lives were turned completely upside down. We started attending church, but Daddy was afflicted by an orphan spirit. See, my grandfather suffered from severe institutional mental illness and spent a lot of time in and out of Bryce's Hospital in Tuscaloosa. Just get the unaddicted and you'll read all this. My grandmother was left to care for seven boys and two girls with a second grade education in a cabin in, on Newcastle Mountain that had no electricity, that had dirt floors, that what they ate, what the government gave them, what they could grow, and what they could shoot and kill. I'm talking about raccoons, possums, rabbits, squirrels, anything they could, blackbirds, bluebirds, anything they could kill, that's what they ate. There were some uncles and a Baptist preacher, but no one really stepped up to be my dad's spiritual father. But God. Because my daddy repented from all sin, the curse was broken. As I've mentioned multiple times, on May the 27th, 2007, several demons left me as I fervently prayed in my heavenly language in a Walker County jail. Like the prodigal son, when I came to my senses, I knew my way back home, not just to a right relationship with my biological father, but a right relationship with our father. So there I am. However, I still had a misconception of God's very nature. I understood him as a God of punishment. Because my daddy, he didn't say a whole lot. But when you know, when he reached for that belt, a whipping and a whipping that you would remember was coming. So I recognized God as a God that would beat the skin off me when I messed up. I recognized him as a God that worked three jobs and pastored a church. I recognized God as a God of rules. I recognized him as a God that didn't really have time for a relationship. He put food on the table. I knew that he loved me, but there was a disconnect. Why was there a disconnect between me and my dad and we finished things right? Why was there a disconnect? Because there was a disconnect between him and his dad. He was a God. He was the Lord God Almighty, not Abba Father. He was the Lord of Heaven's army, not Abba Father. The Word of God truthfully and right, rightfully proclaims Him to be Abba, Father. Luke 15, 11 through 32, we see a parable about the prodigal son. The prodigal son, the younger son, went to the father and he said, I want my share of the state now before you die. The father agreed and divided it and gave him his part of the inheritance. Then the Prodigal of the younger son went out and had a party, right? He, he had a big, big party. It said that he found himself in a foreigner's land slopping hogs. Let me tell you something about Jews. They don't mess with hogs. It was unclean. And not only was he hanging around them, feeding them, he actually began to look at the pods that they were feeding the hogs with. And he said, that looks like it can satisfy me. But then it says something profound when he finally came to his senses in verse 17. Listen to this. He came to his senses. He said in verse 17, it said to himself, At home even the hired servants have food enough to spare, and here I am dying of hunger. I will go home to my father and say, Father, I have sinned against both heaven and you. And I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Please take me as a hired servant. So he returned home to his father. And while he was still a long ways off, his father saw him coming, filled with love and compassion. He ran to his son, embraced him, and kissed him. His son said to him, Father, I have sinned against you in heaven. Down in verse, and I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father cried out. He said, quit. Bring the finest robe. Bring me his ring back. Let's have a party. Let's celebrate. My son was lost, but now he's found. So they killed the fattened calf and had a feast. Verse 25. Meanwhile, the older son was in the fields working. 
When he returned home, he heard music and dancing in the house. And he asked one of the servants what was going on. Your brother's back, he was told. And his father had killed a fattened calf. And they're celebrating. And the older brother was angry and wouldn't go in. His father came out and begged him and replied, All these years, this is the son, he's telling the father, All these years I have slaved for you. And never once refused to do a single thing you told me. And in all that time, you never give me even a young goat to feast with my friends. Yet, when this son of yours, not brother, comes back after squandering your money on prostitutes, you celebrated by killing a fattened calf. His father said to him, Look, dear son, you have always stayed with me, and everything I have is yours. We had to celebrate this happy day for your brother was dead and now has come back to life. He was lost, but he was found. So many lessons to learn from this. Basically, the son told the father, I wish you were dead. Dead. The dad emphatically enabled the son. He gave the son the money to go out to party with. But even in our enabling, sometimes God is working. Let me tell you something. It's not sometimes. Even when you mess up, if you're praying, God is working. Yes. Another one, sin will take you places you can't even imagine. Can somebody say amen? amen. Make you do things you said you would never do. It costs you everything you love. Everything worth having is sin will cost you. When sin had its perfect work at the bottom, at the lowest point, the younger son came to his senses. Stop preventing your loved ones from reaching their bottom by enabling their addiction. And I don't even know if we got anybody in here doing that, but a lot of people watch us online. Your younger son was humble. Willing to go home. The younger son was humbled, willing to go home and truly repent, asking for forgiveness and taking the position as a servant. Let me tell you what precedes all great God encounters. Humility. No one is worthy of being a son or a daughter of the Lord God Almighty, but it pleases Him to call you His child. The best of us are unworthy, but it pleases God to call you His son. It pleases God to call you His daughter. Our Father doesn't desire you as a servant. He desires you as a son and a daughter. We are not pawns of the Lord God Almighty meant for servitude. We are His beloved children who serve Him out of love. Abba Father desires to serve you. What did His Father serve the Son? He desires to serve you. Jesus Christ said that I did not come to be served, but to serve. He served us on the cross. He was a resurrected. He sent His Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit still serves us today. He wants to restore you to your rightful position, not as a servant, and give you back the inheritance you wasted on sinful living. Any parents in here get pleasure out of their doing for their kids? I mean, seriously, do you enjoy? How much more so does God enjoy doing for you? How many people have had kids act stupid, right? Amen. But did you enjoy doing for your kids? Were you still happy to see them? Did you still want to serve them? God wants to serve you. Abba Father doesn't want you living in the servant quarters. He wants you to abide in His house. Most folks look at this story and they only see the prodigal son as one struggling with the orphan spirit. After all, he had no appreciation for his relationship with his father. And like Esau, he had no appreciation for his inheritance. But the younger son isn't the only son struggling with a curse. Let's look at how the orphan spirit found its way into the good son's thinking. And this is where many of us are. He thought that he had to work to earn his inheritance. Did you hear what he said? All these years I have slaved for you. Was he not born the oldest son? Was he not born into the inheritance? Somebody needs to realize when you were born again, you were born into the inheritance to the kingdom of God. It's nothing that you can earn. And we 
know that he thought he had earned it because of the way he acted when the younger brother returned. The older brother was self-righteous, thinking that he had earned his position as a son when he was simply born into the position. After all, he was faithful. He worked hard. He followed the rules, right? Is it important to be faithful? Amen. It's important to work hard, but if you're doing it to earn God's love, please stop. Please stop. If you are working hard, if you are tithing, if you are giving to earn God's love, slow down. Study what it means to be a Christian. Stop working hard to earn God's love. Work hard because God loves you and He's revealed that in your innermost being. When we serve God from a place of obligation and not appreciation by way of revelation, we will always look down on others. Who are we to think we have been good enough or worked hard enough to earn God's mercy and His grace brought to all mankind through the horrific event of Calvary? So how do we break this curse? Demons are cast out. Curses are broken. And curses are typically broken by a biological or a spiritual father. But when the biological father isn't present, someone has to step in and intercede. I remember praying for Paige. And I'm going to share three testimonies real quick to show you how this revelation has come to me. Sis and I were downstairs. We started around 2 o'clock. It was 10 o'clock before she got free. The demon would manifest, should go out and what I can best now call a demonic trance. The Lord would tell me to bind the demon and talk to Paige. I would bind the demon and I would ask her how she's doing and the Lord would say, tell her that you love her, that you will not reject her, that you will not abandon her, that you accept her, that you're not going to throw her away. Time after time after time again, I begin to tell her that she finally accepted it. And later on that night, she began to pray in tongues, and the last demon left. The last marriage class we had, Malik had his last uh, session. I don't even know what you call it. And I'll talk about that a little bit in a second. We're going to be doing a podcast about it again, but... I went outside as I felt the Holy Spirit instruct me to do. I went out there and Jacob is doubled over in pain as the demon was manifesting and twisting him on the inside. We took him in the church. We brought him upstairs and we began to pray for him. As the demons manifested, Josh looked at Marilyn as the Holy Spirit gave him a word and said, tell Jacob you love him. As soon as Marilyn looked at him like Marilyn does with so much conviction, she says, Jacob, I love you. At that very time, I was taken into the spirit and I saw an umbilical cord running from my wife to Jacob representing a spiritual mother. So what has this got to do with the orphan spirit? Just keep following me. We have been praying for Malik for weeks. A few Sundays back, Malik came to the altar and I heard the Holy Spirit tell me to let Malik know you love him, you accept him, you will not abandon or reject him. I'm not sure what happened that night, but later that very particular morning, but later on in that day in our front yard, Malik was released from more demons. Each of these encounters were growing more and more intense as we were getting to the strong man, the demon that was at the bottom that really had control of him. A few days later in the marriage class, I don't even know, I don't remember what I said, but boy, we riled that old devil up. Been praying and fasting, seeking the Lord about what was holding Malik back from getting free. That is when the Holy Spirit started to download concerning what we talk about Wednesday night, what we're talking about today, and what we will talk about before we dedicate the babies next week. Abuse, rejection, abandonment from our earthly fathers creates resentment, bitterness, and unforgiveness in their children. The children project their feelings toward their biological fathers onto Abba Father. 
If this isn't dealt with, generational iniquities become a generational curse. Demons move in and they begin to control the individual life. Freedom comes for those dealing with this curse by them really being loved by spiritual parents, by a spiritual church, by mentors, by pastors, by a new church family. They cannot comprehend the love of Abba Father until a church shows them what love looks like. It is our responsibility. And I not take it seriously. As they accept the spiritual family's love, they will then accept Abba Father's love. The demons will be cast out and the curse will be broken. You've heard me say a million times, just about all addiction stories stem from a disconnect between the child and the father. Ephesians 3, 14 through 21. I need you to grasp this. I need you to understand what God thinks about you. You say, Ron, hey, I don't know. I know I, listen, I don't need to know what you did. I know what I did. And it's bad. But I know this scripture applies to me because I've seen God restore everything that the enemy has told. I live a life of purpose. I walk in contentment. I walk in victory. I get to serve God 24 hours a day, seven days a week. I get to go to bed at night to sleep praying for you, waking up in the middle of the night praying for you, get up in the morning praying and studying. I know God restored everything that I relinquished to the enemy. So this scripture, if it applies to me, it applies to you as well. Ephesians 3, 14 through 21, when I think of all this, I fall on my knees and pray to the Father, the creator of everything in heaven and on earth. Man, it is a big, big, big and good, good God. I pray from His glorious unlimited resources. He will empower you with inner strength through His Spirit. In power, hmm. we've taken dominion back. Then Christ will make his home in your hearts as you trust him. Your roots will grow down into God's love and keep you strong. And may you have the power to understand, as all of God's people should, how wide how long, how high, and how deep His love is. May you experience the love of Christ, though it is too great to fully understand. Then you will be made complete with all fullness of life and the power that comes from God. Now, oh, glory to God who is able through His mighty power at work within you to accomplish infinitely more than we might ask or even think glory to him in the church and in Christ Jesus through all generations forever and ever. Amen. So as a local church in this community, what is pure and undefiled religion? There's a lot of 30-year-old orphans running around. There's a lot of grown men that don't know, never had, they don't know. They're just lost. How do you expect them to act? Why do you think she's down there selling herself at the truck stop? Do you think she just chose that? Do you think that's just a life she chose? And this world is wicked. But we are the light of God. And the light reveals all darkness and the light purifies. The light sets free. But we, it is up to us, it is up to this church to break that generational curse of an orphan. You know, and I'm, I'm serious. I thank God that I'm not going to run over those funeral all year. I just want to see people free. You want to see people free? Get your oppression form done and get it to us. Yes. I'm not going to pressure you to go through deliverance. There's a lot of people in here with stuff on. 
You can hide it from some folks. You can't hide it from the pastor because God talks to me about you. And God needs you to be free. Yes. So you can be the light that Jesus has called you to be. One day, everybody stands before God. They either go left or right. I don't pray against principalities. I preach the gospel to the broken. That's right. I don't engage in spiritual warfare down at the, the strip club. I don't walk around that place praying. I witness to the stripper as God gives me the opportunity to tell her that God loves her and she don't have to do that, that God will make a way. Father, we love you. We thank you for your spirit. We thank you for your anointing. Father, I pray that our hearts would be broken, God, crushed for the lost. Father, that we would gladly and passionately lay aside every weight and sin that is keeping us from being the light to this community. Father, fill us, Lord, with your love. Father, give every spiritual parent in this room Wisdom, strength, and courage. Father, help us parent those that are lost or in, in need. Father, help us show them love. Help us correct them in love. Help us walk beside them. God, give us the strength to do so. Father, this is your church. This is your service. Father, have your way in the rest of it. In Jesus' holy name, amen. Does anyone need prayer for anything in their body as we open the altars up.